Um, my question is that about the professions in the Pribla Capital that move from governmental agencies to the uh, academic centers. So my question is that how common is it and is it such a personal decision or other factors? Um, I would say it's not common yeah. and it's not easy, you know? And so, um, you know, if I did it, I was in two government jobs, the State Health Department, EPA, then I went to Hopkins. And there were other people on the faculty at Hopkins who were very skeptical about me as a professor when I was hired there, you know, because I hadn't come up through the ranks that way. I had come over transom, the same as far as they were concerned. And they weren't sure that I would be able to do the things you have to do to survive in academia, which is, you know, to not only teach well and be able to, and teaching isn't just standing up and talking, you have to construct curriculum, you have to assess students, it's not easy, but also writing grants and getting research, which is very important in a place like Hopkins. And if I had been in, in academia as a postdoc, an assistant professor, I would have had um, much more modeling of those behaviors by more senior people, it probably would have been a little bit easier than jumping in the water and learning how to swim. And, and but, but yet here, if you look around our school, um, another person who's done such a thing, um, Alan Greenberg, had a whole career in public health before coming here. He's been a very successful academic. You know, we, I can point to examples of that, but frankly, I can also point to examples of people who tried to do that who I know were very unhappy with trying to be academics. Either they didn't like doing those things, or they felt frustrated with being cut off from being, you know, a teammate in the action, in the only action. Um, I'd, I'd say well, I, a slightly different view. The, the part of EPA that I was responsible for was essentially the science and technology arm, and it's mostly people with advanced degrees. And there, I saw people kind of going in both directions. I just wrote uh, you know, a letter for a, a guy who worked for me at EPA who was moving into a faculty position um, at Texas A&M. And we had people when I was at EPA that we hired out of universities because at that time, EPA was doing some really cool stuff and looking for new kinds of talent like bioinformaticists and things like that. So at the, but that's at the very researchy level. It's different than, you know, Lynn's talking about that, you know, sort of that policy hands in with that mix of all nuttiness that's going on. And these are people who are, <laughs> what, what did you call it? Uh, University Without Students. University. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's what they, they used to call it. It was not entirely um, admirable. You know, the University of ORD, which was the Office of Research and Development. And they had the idea that these people were all, wanted to be like academics and do research and didn't care as much about what the, the rest of the agency was doing. Um, so these are people who are very interested in the researchy side. So there, I think there may be a little more jumping back and forth. But I think that this idea, the ac academia is going to be skeptical of someone who hasn't just come up through that, that climbed that greasy pole. Um, and even a lot of researchers, you know, so there, there are a lot of people who are very successful doing research in the context of a government agency or industry where they're part of a research agenda that's being established for that organization who are absolutely at sea with the idea, I'm just going to come up with an idea out of nowhere and write a grant and get someone like NIH to fund it. Those are t it's not for everyone to do that. It really isn't. And um, on the one hand, it gives you a tremendous amount of freedom because you can do what you want to do. And it, and, it, and it allows you to be creative and to take your ideas and try to translate them into something. But on the other hand, it's much more secure. I mean, even with NIH, people in the intramural program, it's a very different thing than being funded by their extramural program and being at a university. Because you, you know, you're part of a group that, you know, they have steady stream of funding and, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a trade-off between freedom and security. When have we heard of that before? Yeah. But anyway. But after a few years, it, unless you're in one of the research centers in the government, yeah. after a few years, the, the more year, years you're in the government, the harder it is to move back in academia because you don't have the publications and you have to start out with a doctoral degree. We often get people who move the other way. We have a number of, of 
who started out in academia who said, this really isn't for me. And then they were, for the most part, fine in government. Not everybody makes the transition in either direction. And uh, if you just wanted to give us an advice, for a doctoral student, do you suggest us to sit down and make a decision whether we wanted to continue in governmental agencies or university? Or I think for the first few years out, that you you you're much more able to move back and forth, you know, at the beginning and right out of doctoral training. People expect you to have some kind of a postdoctoral experience, whether that is be a postdoc or be like a research scientist somewhere. But you know, even if you were going into academe, people don't necessarily expect that you're going right into a tenure track position. That you're, you know, you're somehow you're getting your, you know, you're getting your wings, you know, and becoming more independent one way or the other. Whether it's going to be, you know, to work in an agency or work for a corporation or work in academe. So I, I don't think there's a lot of pressure to um, specialize at that point. You're still Pretty pluripotent for a few years. <laughs> um, but you probably have to keep publishing. Publishing is important, but I, my, the jobs I had in government mostly, it was also important for me to publish. You know, um, so. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, not many people are lucky enough to get a call from you know, presidential administration for. Job. It was an accident. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, but what advice do you have kind of throughout your career besides being actively involved in a professional organization to kind of keep the inertia going in your career? You know, like if you have a job and you're somewhat happy with it, but you're, you know, continuing, you want to kind of keep moving, um, how do you kind of, you know, develop that network or maintain that kind of prominence? skills kind of to give you the ability to kind of move when you're ready? Well, I don't know. I'm probably the last person to have. But, you know, I think the issues of, you know, being in a professional community, which I really wasn't, um, certainly, you know, helps a lot. Uh, because then you, you know what's happening in, in, in several areas. And having contacts in NGOs and the government and academia and all of these little circles uh, is extremely important. Because then you know about things that, that are happening. And also, you know, you scan the, the journal advertisements and you, you, if you're in that mode until you decide, I'm done, I'm, I'm not going to get another job, I'm not, whatever, then you have to always be vigilant about opportunities. You, you can't ever... I think you've got to grab the opportunities to get you out to the public. I and mean, I think all of the jobs I have, well, most, or before OSHA, but the various changes that I made, um, often came from where I did one th thing, either I gave a lecture and someone heard about it, or I wrote something and someone called me because they saw that paper, or I served on a panel and something, and that's literally that's how I got the energy department, is people saw you know, the work that I did. With I and mean, that really makes a difference. You, you don't want to be aggressive about it or pushy, but you want to be out there, you know, not because you're trying to promote yourself, but because you care about these issues, and that's how you have an impact. Well, I do think that you have to try to sell yourself. <laughs> right. I, mean, yeah, I, I do yeah. think that that's a real, realistic. But, but I do think early on how you sell yourself is by being really good at something. That's right. Being yeah. really, really good at something. <clears throat> and I mean, I sometimes have students say, you know, how I learned how to be a leader, you know, develop more leadership skills. And that is important. But I think early on, other skills are incredibly important. Whatever you're really, really good at, doing that really well, doing that one thing really, really well, and I think I said before, you know, making yourself indispensable and visibly, yeah, visible and visibly, well. it doesn't help to hide. And that might mean that you're, you're doing that not only at your job, but, you know, with a professional association and, you know. Um, and if there's a newsletter in the professional organization, write things for it, then you'll get that. Write about the things you're passionate about, yeah. you know, that you care about. Start a blog. Start a blog. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time for one or two more questions. Are there any last minute ones? I'm um, sorry to a question about mentorship. Um, so Dr. Gray, you had mentioned writing a letter for somebody, recommending them for a job. Um, do you have any suggestions on how to gracefully keep those 
foster those relationships because like when you are applying for jobs asking for recommendations hopefully you're going to have that job for a couple of years and you're not going to need a recommendation for a couple of years from that person again um, but still keeping in touch and like I, I just I'm always a bit that, that, that's a really good yeah. question I think it's it's, it's, it's got to go beyond LinkedIn right exactly yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I, I guess I'm sounding a little bit like a broken record but professional organizations okay. you know again this, so this guy that I wrote the letter for you know it's been five years since I was at EPA working with him he was always somebody I was impressed by I kept I see him at national meetings because he goes and he presents something that he's doing okay. and you know, talk to him and it's uh, you're, you're sort of just you, you stay in, 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 in contact um, I'm sure there's there's other ideas but that's just one that I think is really important alumni events if it's your professors come back you know yeah, yeah. Um, Melissa will hold some kind of event yeah. for departmental alumni and it's a great excuse yeah. to just come in and say hello and okay. and, and we have a mentoring program as well yeah. <laughs> but I also don't feel embarrassed about reaching back to people two or three years later uh, people remember you a lot better than you think they might especially if they've ever written a letter of recommendation for you then you've already created a situation where they're likely to remember you I've never been, you know, upset about somebody contacting me three, four, five years later and asking for another letter, and I kind of learned how to save them. So <laughs> <laughs> the first two paragraphs. You right? update them, you know. Yeah, it's like, oh, when did I, you know, when did I know the student? You know, you can't be right. You didn't mind writing it for them in the first place. It's okay to write it. Yeah, it's never, it's, it's yeah. never, never a place to go back and, right. and ask for that uh, that recommendation right. again, but. Um, I have some former students who do kind of know, and then they write something. They'll send me, send it to me. Thought you might be interested in this. Nothing wrong with that, and, and it, it does kind of make me feel good to see what they're doing. Um, it's not an imposition at all. Or if you see something they wrote, just drop them and they'll say that was great. Like that. That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> Any additional questions? Oh, do write them a thank you for the letter of recommendation. I'm sure they taught you that already. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with that, I'd like to give a great round of applause to our panel. Um, I appreciate you being here so very much, especially late in the evening. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you.